Hi everybody. Welcome to Chapter 6 of Speeding. I'm Gio, and I'm glad you stopped by my channel. If you haven't been here before, I write gay stories and novels and present them here. If this is your kind of thing, sit back and enjoy. Let's catch you up. Ethan is gay and is in love with his best friend, Pete, who is straight. Pete has been trapped into a blind date that he doesn't want to go to. Ethan is helping him get ready. Pete's about to get evicted from his apartment as well, but he is too afraid to tell anyone or ask for help. And now, Speeding, Chapter 6. Pete, Saturday, August 6th. 25 days until I'm evicted. We arrived at Ethan's apartment complex, and he led the way up to his perfect apartment. It smelled of warm vanilla. Sabretooth ran to Ethan. He picked up the dog and let her lick his face. Who's a good girl? Sabretooth's a good girl. Did you miss me? Jump in the shower, Pete. I'll be right back. He grabbed the leash and the dog pooped bags from the top of the kennel cab and took Sabretooth down to the pallon. I walked back to the sparkling bathroom with its folded towels and folded washcloths and body wash. If I didn't know better, I'd think I was in a hotel. As stupid as it sounded, I felt guilty for tossing my sweaty clothes on the counter before I jumped in the shower. Ethan yelled into the bathroom a couple minutes later. I've set some clothes on the bed. Do you want boxers or boxer briefs? They've never been worn, so you don't have to feel weird or anything. Boxers, I yelled out. A couple of minutes later, I had showered and wrapped a towel around me. What was I going to do about Cindy? Better question. Ethan's apartment looked exactly like it did the last time I was here. How did he do it? I already knew. He only owned 200 things. Ethan must never see my apartment and my 200,000 million things. As I left the bathroom, Ethan entered. While he showered, I dressed in an ironed and creased shirt, an ironed and creased slacks. Did Ethan even iron his socks? Since I had a second, I snooped in Ethan's almost empty closet. It looked just like it did on Wednesday. Imagine the things I could store in this empty space. Ethan wasted a lot of space. He had a couple of folders and some large manila envelopes. One held his guitar music and a couple of guitar picks. Another held three years of his tax papers. The next manila envelope held his will and final wishes. Ethan's only 22. He shouldn't think about these things for another 50 years. Ethan came out of the bathroom, wrapped only in a towel. I quickly put the folders and manila envelopes back where I had found them. I turned around to ask Ethan why he had a will, but stopped. What I wouldn't give to be in as good a shape as he was. Look at how slim his waist is, or the definition in his biceps. His abs were tight, and when he turned, the light outlined his pecs. As he dressed, he faced his bed, accidentally displaying the green and blue hummingbird tattoo on his shoulder. An exquisite picture. When Ethan's shoulder moved, the bird seemed to come alive. Ethan wasn't bulky, but wiry, like a gymnast who lifted weights. Good thing he was gay. I couldn't compete with the ladies against a body like that, or the casual way he could smile. If I was gay... I'd ask for his number in a second. Good thing I'm not gay. I quickly looked away from my best friend and into his closet. Good. Ethan never caught me staring at him. He grabbed a pair of ironed boxer briefs, an iron pair of slacks, and an iron shirt. As he dressed, he asked me, Did you look through the list? What was I missing? I'd left the list at my place, but had read it enough to depress me. Two socks count as one pair, even though it's two? I count units as one item, like my bed. 
It might be a box spring, mattress, frame, and headboard, but it counts as one unit, Ethan said. That's cheating, isn't it? I said. Since I make the rules, no, it isn't, Ethan said. How do you decide what to throw away? I asked. You're looking at it wrong. I don't decide what to throw away. It comes down to what I use and need. If I can't remember the last time I used something, obviously I don't need it, so I get rid of it, Ethan said. If it's something I use almost daily, like my car, razor, or toothbrush, then I definitely need it, so I keep it. How long do you give an item before you decide you don't need it? Depends on the object, but usually a year. Or if it gets dusty, Ethan said. What about a coat for winter, or boots? We live in southern Nevada. A hoodie is usually fine. Or I layer up, he said. What if you see something on sale that you have to have? What then? I asked. First of all, I don't impulse buy. Let's say I need a shirt to replace one that's wearing out or one I don't like. I give myself time to think about it. It could be a week or a month, but I don't buy something just to buy, Ethan said. But you'll miss the sale, I said. So what? The stores don't tell me when to buy something. That's my choice and my finances, not theirs, Ethan said. You are weird. Ignoring a sale? Will you only buy something to replace something else? Who does that? I said. My philosophy is, one thing out, one thing in. That's how I shop. And who lives like that? Your weird best friend, Ethan said. Do you just throw things away? I asked. Depends on the item. If it's still in good shape, I donate it. If not, I trash it. If it's a book, it usually goes to the library, he said. You don't keep books? I said, horrified. I keep them because I might read them again. I used to do that, but most of the time I read a book and then it just sat there taking up space. Now, when I'm done, it's off to the library it goes. That way other people can read it, or the library can sell it at their book sale. I once gave them to a used bookstore, but I have so much credit that it doesn't matter. Keeping it would be selfish. Ethan sat on his bed and pulled his socks on. If I ever want to read it, I buy it again. That way I help support the author. I think I've only done that twice. What about that one? I pointed at his one book. I use it all the time. It was one of my training manuals when I got my EMT2 certificate. I thought all ambulance drivers did was drive around, I said. We don't sit around. Some days we are busier than the firemen and the paramedics. We do a lot of the same things paramedics do. The big difference is that they are certified to deal with heart issues. Sometimes we have to take the stretcher into hazardous places to get a patient, say a burning building, and bring them out so the paramedics can work on them. We have fire gear stored on the rig. We do whatever is necessary to get the patient to the hospital. Sometimes we transport patients down to the big hospital down in Vegas, or from nursing homes to the hospital, in addition to helping the injured get to the hospital. Sometimes the paramedics are busy on another job, and it's just Tia and me handling things. You don't ever slow down, I said. Sometimes I can crash in the bunk room at the station for a couple of hours of sleep. It's not restful, because an alarm can come at any time. Sunday mornings are usually calm, but it can turn into total chaos in a second. Some days, especially Halloween and New Year's, are total chaos for the entire shift. I turned back to the closet. If you only keep things that are useful, why keep the toy Lamborghini? I asked. Ethan paused a moment and took a breath. When he spoke, he stared at me. His voice quivered. Uh-oh. This was about to get awkward. There are some things you can't part with. Like wedding rings. Or a toy car the man I love gave me on my 18th birthday, Ethan said. Awkward and deep and very personal. Something caught in my throat for a moment. Good thing I like you, because somebody has to keep you sane, I said, trying to be funny. He'd hung on to my present for years. That toy car was one of Ethan's 200 things, which meant he valued it as much or more than most things. 
Ethan kept only the important things. By extension, I was important to him. He already said he loved me, but this one simple act struck deep. Why did that make my chest ache? We shared a glance, a meaningful moment. What would have happened between us if Ethan had told me he loved me years ago? We wouldn't have fallen in love. That would be silly. I was straight. But maybe our friendship might have deepened. We're going to be late, boy toy, Ethan mumbled and grabbed a pair of shoes from his closet. The moment we had shared had broken. You'll have to wear your basketball shoes because I don't have something else you can use. Don't move. Ethan grabbed some hair product from his closet and quickly applied it to my hair and styled it with his fingers. Time to lighten the mood. I leaned in close and said, Admit it. You wish I was your boy toy. Did Spencer ever tell you how cute you are when you get embarrassed? Basketball shoes it is. Let's get out of here, Ethan said. We went into the kitchen where Ethan pulled his dog food from the bottom shelf. In the fridge? I don't believe this. You keep Sabretooth's food in your fridge, I said. Ethan didn't even look up as he refilled Sabretooth's dishes. Food on the floor attracts ants, mice, cockroaches, rats, you name it. Food stored in an airtight fridge stays fresher longer and keeps the vermin out. I didn't know how to answer that. I left old takeout containers everywhere. No wonder I had a mouse problem. Time to change the subject. What do I tell Cindy? You'll think of something, Ethan said, putting the dog food back in the fridge. He buttoned the last buttons on his shirt. Wednesday. Was that why things got weird between us? Why didn't you tell me? I got mad at Mom and tried to cool off, I said. I wanted to be a good friend, but that almost didn't turn out. So your excuse for the other night is that your mom made you do it? Ethan chuckled. I told Mom I was on a date then, and I have a date tonight. It didn't stop her, I said. So your mom thinks you were on a date when you were with me, and you blocked her, Ethan said. Pete, you are very talented at screwing up your life. It's not me, it's Mom, I said. Mom goes through her poor me routine about how she taught me better, and how I disappointed her, and why can't I be a better son. She keeps going on and on until I agree with her. I'm not unblocking her. What do I do? Ethan sighed. I don't know. Do you want me to sit with you and Cindy tonight? I don't care anymore, I said. No matter what I do, Mom keeps ruining my life. I'll take that as a yes, Ethan said. Is this your way of going out with me without asking me out? Are you flirting with me? I said, putting my hands on my hips and trying to look mad. If I said yes, you'd say I was desperate for your body, and if I said no, you'd say I was lying, so I'll simply say, maybe. Ethan smiled and led the way to his car. He held up his keys and winked at me. I'm driving, boy toy. Later, I'll be your Uber, and I can drop the two of you off at your place for a nightcap. As if that would happen, nobody ever saw my place. Once again, Ethan didn't mean to, but he intimidated me. His car was spotless, shined, and smelled like a new car. With the way he took care of it, it looked professionally detailed. Ethan will never, never, never go into my apartment or my car. Once he saw the real me, he'd run, lose my number, and scribble out my yearbook picture. Did Ethan even keep his yearbooks? Ethan had everything going for him. Not like me. I'm a fake. I spend hours trying to look good so people would like me. I don't dare trust people, because they would not like the real me. You went quiet, Ethan said, as we drove. I'm just nervous, I said. We arrived at Mama Italiana's twenty minutes late. I can't believe how good Ethan looked in a dark fitted sports coat and slacks. I wore his silk shirt and another pair of his slacks. For a guy who didn't spend anything, he sure had nice clothes. We passed our reflection in a store window, and I had to stop. We were both crisp in ironed shirts and creased slacks. 
Ethan looked amazing and stood next to another amazing looking guy. Was that me? How did he make my hair look so good? His clothes fit me better than mine did. I looked different, but good different. Too bad it was only for tonight. Maybe Ethan's complex had a gym because his clothes hugged his body in all the right places. Someday, some mysterious guy would sweep poor Ethan off his feet and they'd fall in love. When they got married, the ambulance would pick them up after the service. Love and marriage, that would never happen to me. Imagine me carrying my bride over the threshold. She'd run away screaming when she saw a mouse running across the cluttered counter. Ethan didn't have that problem. He'd carry his new husband into his perfect apartment and they'd sip wine before they turned their phones off. Lucky guy. Wait, was I getting jealous of my gay best friend? What are you going to tell Cindy? Ethan said. This isn't going to end well, is it? I said. Stop being so negative. Tell her the truth, Ethan said. I don't think it's fair for Cindy to be stuck between me and Mom, I said. Just explain how your mom is, Ethan said. Mama Italiana's was one of the nicest restaurants in the Butte, and its prices reflected that. Expensive. It had a million black and white framed photos on the walls, many of the celebrities that came here. It had living potted plants everywhere, and a traveling violinist and smelled of grilled steaks and garlic. It didn't have regular lights and light bulbs, but old-fashioned ones that gave off a warm glow, just barely brighter than candlelight. Everything here was handmade, even the pasta, and every fruit and vegetable and sauce was fresh or freshly made. They must own a farm somewhere. They had a professional chef from Venice who designed the menus and changed them for every season. Mama Italiana's was the kind of place you'd impress a date with on Valentine's Day. That made me even more nervous. Was Ethan this nervous the other day when he came out to me? I whispered to Ethan, Thanks for coming with me. I owe you. It's Melissa all over again. How are you going to explain me coming along? Am I your chaperone? Ethan asked. I gave him a wobbly smile. I'm glad Ethan's here, because I don't know what to do. We went to the host. You have reservations for Peter Stone and two guests? We do, but the reservations were made for two people, not three, the host said. I brought my friend, I said. There should be a woman already here. Will three be a problem? The host flipped a few pages in a book and followed the page with his finger until he stopped on an entry. I spoke with the woman who set up the reservation, a Mrs. Terry Stone, and she was quite clear that the table was for two. She wanted a romantic setting with flowers, a romantic Italian Cabernet 2001, and a romantic serenade by the violin player, he said. Give it an intimate, romantic feel, light romantic candles, and give them a romantic view of the sunset, she said. I'm sorry, but here at Mama Italiana's we don't allow candles but we did place a small vase with two red roses. Will that do? Mom strikes again. Can you reset the table for three and cancel the romantic violin, I said. Of course, if you'll come with me, the host said. And waving for a waiter to attend him, he quickly whispered something to the waiter who rushed off. The table was near a westerly window with a beautiful view of the sky. It would be perfect to watch the sunset if we stayed that long. As we walked to the table, a couple of waiters quickly added an extra chair and an extra place setting and an extra rose to the vase. All well the woman watched. She had a polite smile that disappeared as we approached. What's going on? Cindy Wilson was definitely on the other side of 30. Short brunette hair, stylish gold glasses, and she wore a pale yellow top with a beige jacket. A small jeweled cap pin was attached to her left lapel. Cindy, I'm Pete Stone. I believe there are a few things I should explain, I said. I'd like you to meet my friend, Ethan. A pleasure, ma'am, Ethan said. You brought your friend, 
From the picture? I don't understand. Your mother said this was a date, Cindy said. Ethan and I took our seats, and before we could speak, a waitress arrived bringing menus and a wine list in spite of the fact the Cabernet was cooling in a silver ice bucket on the table's edge. May I recommend our fresh-made bruschetta, along with today's special, a ribeye steak marinated in our custom sauce and grilled to perfection. In addition, we offer our fresh-made pasta with fresh pesto, she said, and we have a blush made here in Nevada that I think is much better than the Italian Cabernet. It has a better bouquet and a nice fruity taste that reminds me of strawberries, and it is cheaper. Ethan glanced at the menu and leaned close to speak with me. Who's paying for all this? Pete, I assumed you were, Cindy said. I took a slow breath and let it out. Mom set this up, ordered an expensive wine, and neglected to mention the details. Ethan, now you see why I get so frustrated with her. Don't worry about me, then, Ethan said, and then turned to the waitress. Separate check for me, please. I'll have the spaghetti pomodoro made with zucchini pasta and grilled chicken. Throw in a side of your fresh-picked vegetable medley. What's in it today? Zucchini, onions, summer squash, tomatoes, and grilled carrots simmered in oregano, garlic, basil, and olive oil, she said. Freshly grated Parmesan cheese can be added at no extra charge. That sounds good, and I'll take an extra order for lunch tomorrow. If you bring it when you bring the check, I'd appreciate it, Ethan said. My best friend, so polite, so easygoing. He can make conversation with anybody, not like me. Sitting here scared me. Very good, sir, the waitress said. That's not fair, Ethan, that you have to pay, I said. I'll pay for all three of us. Cindy, your turn to order. The marinated tenderloin, well done, with handmade spaghetti, with your wild boar ragu, she said. Excellent, ma'am, the waitress said. I scanned the menu. Ethan had chosen one of the cheapest things on the dinner menu, and Cindy had chosen one of the more expensive. This was going to be a meal that cost multiple decimal places. We'll start with the bruschetta, and I'll have what Ethan is having, minus the vegetable medley. Very good, sir, she said. Would you prefer to keep the Cabernet 2001, or switch to the local blush? What's the price difference, I asked. The waitress told me. The blush was cheaper by half. I prefer the blush. Ethan, Cindy, what about you? It's local. Let's try it. And if we like it, we can take a bottle home for later, Ethan said. Cindy seemed like she was about to say something, but instead said, I prefer the Cabernet. Of course she would. She didn't have to pay. Now what do I do? The Cabernet was the same price as all our meals combined. This was going to be one very expensive meal. Ethan must have seen my pause, or maybe he knew me too well. He gave me a slight half-grin. It's okay, I'll pay half, Ethan said, resting his hands on the table. We can start with the Cabernet and switch to the blush later if we want. Thank you, I mouthed to my best friend. Why did you bring your friend, Cindy said, narrowing her eyes. And why is he helping you pay? I work at the Sinclair IT call center, and we field calls for many name-brand electronics and appliances, but we focus on Sinclair appliances, I said. We don't get paid minimum, but we don't get paid a lot. Ethan drives ambulances, and I think he gets paid more than me. You should see his apartment. Actually, I think you make more than me, Ethan said. I simply don't spend. Cindy clicked her fingernails on the table. What do you mean? Your apartment is nice? The truth is, I said, and paused. What do I tell her? When you texted me on Wednesday, I didn't know how to finish the sentence, so I looked at Ethan. Ethan gave a very slight smile. Pete and I needed to talk on Wednesday, about us. There was something important we needed to discuss. I needed to discuss, privately, Ethan said. I told Mom I had other plans, both then and now, but I don't know what to say, I said. I'm sorry you got involved. Terry said you were at the hospital with a sick friend, Cindy said. 
this is getting complicated. I'm sorry, but Mom lied to you, I said. Pete was at my place, Ethan said. Cindy quickly inhaled. That made it sound like we were serious at his place. I mean, we were serious, but not that kind of serious. Cindy would think Ethan and I were together kind of serious, that we were boyfriend kind of serious. My life just got more complicated. What do I say? I'll stick with the truth. Wednesday, I offended Ethan, and I needed to apologize. It felt like if I didn't do something, I said, not sure how to finish. Let's just say that we were struggling with some issues and needed to talk, Ethan said. It was the truth, but it sounded different when said out loud, like we were, like I was. Why can't I say it? I had to try and explain, no matter how it sounded. Cindy deserved that much. Mom kept calling and calling, and no matter what I said, she sat tonight up even though I had other plans, I said. And Wednesday, Cindy said. It took some time, but Ethan and I worked everything out, I said. You didn't give me a choice. You were screaming, I'm sorry, outside my door at 10.30 at night. We're lucky only one neighbor complained, Ethan said. Did I tell you I was almost late to work Thursday because of you? It was the truth, but it made us sound like we reconciled and made love, like I spent the night at Ethan's. When I didn't, Cindy would get the wrong idea. Forgive me, Ethan. I see a way to survive. I could use this to get back at Mom and have her leave me alone. I hope Ethan will understand. I glanced at him, trying to explain without using any words. My best friend, would he see what I was about to do as a betrayal of our friendship? I should feel terrible about what I was going to do, but an odd, small part of me grew excited. Ethan's hand was sitting on the table next to mine. It would only take one move to completely put Mom in her place. The problem? I was straight. Ethan was gay. Would Ethan go along with the deception? Should I dare do this? Slowly, I lifted my hand and laid it on his. It seemed awkward and strange for a second. Would Ethan hate me? Ethan stared at me, but didn't move his hand away. He rotated his hand until his fingers curled around mine. His hand was firm and calloused, his grip gentle. Our fingers played with each other's fingers until our fingers intertwined. A slight blush had come into Ethan's cheeks, and I think he held his breath. Was he getting the wrong idea? What had I done? Was it too late to change? I didn't want to change. Ethan's eyebrows raised a fraction, and his mouth quirked into a tiny half-smile. He must have the wrong idea. Why do I keep screwing everything up? Ethan gave me a tiny nod. Something inside me lightened up, and before I knew it, I gave my best friend a quick smile. Cindy noticed. Something sad momentarily flashed across her eyes. Then she took a sip of the expensive Cabernet. Her smile returned. I'm glad you explained. Your mother doesn't know you're gay, does she? My strange idea had worked. So why did it hurt? Her simple question sliced through my defenses and sucked deep into my soul. The truth bubbled out before I could stop it. No matter how many times I talked to mom or dad, they never listened, I whispered, as a little bit of me broke free. This didn't even feel like I stretched the truth even a little bit. I mean, I wasn't gay, but in a weird way, it was true. My parents never listened to me. I took a deep breath. Why was I sad all of a sudden? Why did my eyes tear? Because a small, 
vulnerable part of me opened up and told what I had been afraid to speak. My parents never took the time to get to know me. I could be gay or straight or bi or rich or poor or sick or a famous basketball player or even travel the world. And dad wouldn't care as long as I never bothered him. And mom was too busy making sure she got her own way. No, my parents never cared to get to know me, never listened to me. No matter what I said, they heard something else. I avoided looking at either Cindy or Ethan. What had happened? I confessed my innermost pain to a complete stranger and my best friend. I focused on one of the silver forks as something ached inside me. Ethan squeezed my hand. I guess, for the first time, he saw a little bit of my pain, the deep pain I never showed anyone. He let go of my hand and wiped the space right below my eye. Was I crying? Mrs. Stone had forced Pete to do things her way so many times that Pete finally had to block his family, Ethan said softly. His hand held mine, tight. Her and my dad, I said. I wasn't talking about straight or gay anymore. Something inside me hurt. They refused to understand me. When I was growing up, Mom came up with excuses so I could never invite friends over. The few friends I made, Mom made me break up with them. Ethan was one of my first friends, and we became best friends as seniors. We always met somewhere else, so Mom never knew about him. Cindy reached across the table and laid her hand on mine and Ethan's. Believe me, I do understand. Maybe not quite in the same way, but you're not alone. Mom won't let me be me. She has to control as much of my life and my brother's life as she can, I whispered. Mother knows best. Have you talked with anyone about this? Cindy asked. Do you think anyone would believe me? Cindy, you're not the first person Mom's tried to set me up with, I said. Ethan still held my hand, but his eyes showed a deeper concern. She won't listen. She won't listen. That explains many things, Cindy said. I am sorry. I could only nod. Tonight, I know you expected a date, but that's not possible. How about three new friends sitting down for some dinner and some conversation, Ethan said. There was an earnestness about the way he spoke and a casual specialness about the way he smiled. Would I regret holding his hand? Would Ethan regret holding mine? Would he regret that this conversation made us sound like we were in a relationship? What had he said the other day? Our friendship was evolving. What was it evolving into? Three new friends. I would like that, Cindy said, pulling her hand back and holding her wine glass. Good. Pete, everything will be all right, Ethan said, and leaned over and hugged me. I held him tight, and something happened between us, a closeness, a warmth, a momentary trust. I let my guard down and parted my lips. You should have told me, Ethan said, and gently smiled. His hand still softly rested on mine. I kissed him, a slow, lingering, gentle kiss. His lips were soft as crushed velvet, and he closed his eyes. I did as well. His breath was warm, and his hand held my cheek, his thumb caressing the skin below my eye, the slight wetness that had leaked from my eye. I enjoyed Ethan's nearness, his warmth, the soft tickle of his breath. When he pulled away, I think I smiled, because when I opened my eyes, I whispered, Forgive me, I shouldn't have done that. But, wow... Ethan gave me a quick nod, but his hand still held mine. My best friend had the perfect department, perfect life, perfect body, and now the perfect kiss. A small part of my mind flashed back to the conversation the other night, and heaven help me, I did enjoy kissing my best friend. Apology accepted, Ethan whispered. Oh my God, I kissed my best friend. Cindy took a sip of the Cabernet and watched Ethan and I separate.
Ethan's eyes had gently closed, and his mouth remained open, ready for another kiss. A small smile tinted his lips, and a little color had found its way into his cheeks. When Ethan opened his eyes, there was something bright and wonderful, like a kid at Christmas, about them. I'm glad you two found each other, Cindy said, and she sounded genuinely pleased. Oh no, what had I been thinking? When word gets back to Mom about this, she would go insane. Still, would Ethan mind if we tried another kiss sometime? I'm straight, he's gay, he's my best friend. Excuse me for a moment, Cindy went to the restroom, leaving Ethan and me alone. Why was I excited and terrified at the same time? Ethan leaned in close, his voice low. Does anyone else know you're by? Damn, Ethan had gotten the wrong idea. How do I tell my best friend it was all an act? What if it wasn't an act? Because it didn't feel like I was acting. How else could I screw up my life? Thank you, everybody, for sharing this chapter with me. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. Peace.